Welcome to Act and Unwind, an ongoing conversation on a free and virtuous society. I'm your host, Eric Cohn. Thank you for listening. I want to ask that if you're listening to us on our website, that you navigate to the show notes for this episode, where you will find a link to subscribe directly to Act and Unwind at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else that fine podcast products are available. And if you like this program, please leave us a five-star review at Apple Podcasts so as to help more people find this show. This week, I'm joined by Dan Huger, Acton's librarian and a research associate, and Dylan Palman, executive editor of the Journal of Markets and Morality and a research fellow here at Acton. Today, we'll discuss the horrific mass shooting in Highland Park, Illinois, and the Supreme Court's decision in West Virginia v. EPA. But first, I want to go back in time to 1776. So yesterday, Independence Day, 4th of July, uh... I thought it would be good to open today with a conversation of what is the state of the American founding now in the year of our Lord 2022. Uh, it strikes me that it is under attack and, and, you know, to a certain extent, it has always probably been under attack by some faction somewhere. But right now, I think what we're seeing, at least to me, how it distills is – It is under attack certainly from, say, the 1619 Project, uh, which is a project coming from the left trying to recast the American founding not as happening in 1776 and not on the principles that are articulated in the Declaration of Independence, but instead in 1619 and with the arrival of the first slave in the Americas. But it is also on attack – under attack from the right, and you see this from a band of uh, so-called post-liberals who think, uh, at least some of them do, that the American founding itself was a mistake, that its investment in uh, Enlightenment liberalism sowed the seeds of its own destruction. So that would be good to do a little survey on where we think the status of the American founding is right now. Dan? Let's start with you. How strong is the American founding in 2022? I think it's fairly strong. If you, I mean, there are those concerns that I think you've outlined, and there's certainly been a lot of talk about this, but there's also been a sort of revival of interest. You see the Hamilton musical. Um, You see uh, the John Adams miniseries. You see many folks... Um, interested in sort of these very large, meaty biographies of not only American founders, but later American presidents. I'm thinking of Ron Chernow's uh, biography of Grant. Um, These sort of doorstopper books are regular bestsellers, and there seems to be an insatiable appetite for America's founding. Now, there's, there's also an insatiable appetite for criticism um, on both the left and the right. Um, and that is um, not unusual. Um, if you go back to figures like in the abolition movement, William Lloyd Garrison, you know, believed very much that the founding of America was evil and intrinsically linked to slavery. Um, this is a position that was argued forcefully against by uh, folks like Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass, Lysander Spooner, um, who argued that fundamentally the Constitution was a sort of anti-slavery document. They ultimately won the sort of day in terms of interpretation. And, um, and I think uh, when we see today people, even people very critical of the American founding, even people very critical of the constitutional order, are always calling Americans to live up to the ideals of the founding, even if they feel that those ideals were sort of um, never in any sense real. They still, even those people who will deny um, the founding um, as being sort of a just founding will still appeal to the American imagination of the founding, even in their rejection of it um, in political activism. I think this is one of the things that we see rather commonly in culture now, which is this um, in pop culture or at least internet culture, the term of art for it is milkshake ducking, where 
uh, the it's, it comes from a meme that it's a little two a piece cartoon where it's like this is Milkshake Duck, a lovely duck who enjoys drinking milkshakes. Everyone loves Milkshake Duck, and it's 15 minutes later. We regret to inform you that Milkshake Duck is racist. Uh, it is immediately when somebody comes onto the scene that we want to find out like well what's the really terrible thing about them in order to there, there is there is something in the american culture that both likes to build people up and likes to tear them back down uh the form that i think this takes in relevance to this conversation is that we like to try to find uh or some people like to try to find the one thing about uh, something that happens in American history or individuals in American history that points out what should be obvious to all of us, that they're not angels, that they are fallen creatures, that they also did bad things, but they may have also did heroic things. And, and we regard them for their heroic things as if once we find out that one bad thing about them, now it's like, you know, oh, well, that invalidates all of the good that they may have done in their life. Uh, I, I see this trend, which I don't see as existing either really on the left or on the right, this bizarre belief now that these figures should be perfect and that anytime we find a flaw in them, it we don't factor that into the view of the full person or the full moment. We take that as a reason to dismiss them entirely. So to me, I think if it is under assault, it is from that mentality far more than the pointed attacks that you see coming from either the 1619 Project or the post-liberals as, as I described. And I think it's also in large part to – and we'll include a link to this in the show notes. There's a really good essay in National Affairs a number of years ago uh, by a political scientist named Daniel Burns who talked about the difference between uh, liberal theory – and liberal practice, that even if you could, as some of the people on the right would like to totally wash the existence of John Locke from history, even if you could do that, even if you could convince everybody that John Locke, really bad guy, we shouldn't regard him highly in the slightest, you would still have a liberal culture in the United States, that would we would still have liberalism in practice. And I think that that is the fundamental error on the post-liberal side is that we're just – if we would ever move beyond that, that is – an incredibly long-term project that basically involves wrenching every last bit of that liberal practice, liberal culture out of American society. Is it doable? Possibly. But it is an incredibly hard project and one of the reasons that I don't regard that or really for a lot of the same reasons Dan pointed out, the 1619 Project, they're problems. They deserve to be refuted. But is any kind of a deep threat to the American belief in the founding? Yeah, that's a, there's a lot there. Uh, to begin with, I presume Milkshake Duck was voiced by Gilbert Gottfried. Um, <laughs> it would only be right. Right, right. It would make a lot of sense given his duck voicing history. Um, so, I mean, my my simple answer to your, your first question is uh, 246 days without a British king. So far, so good. Um, years, years. Uh, sorry, yes, years, years. Uh, yeah, all right. Uh, years. Um, but as far as the, the project goes and the, the liberal content of America and the founding... Um, you're absolutely right that there, you know, A, there's just not even a, a ton of references to John Locke in particular. There, there's, they definitely were familiar with him, but it's hardly reducible to And also really to not for his political science view. Sure. Like, that was not what the founders were right. interested in. Right. Um, but all the colonies had their own constitutions. And really, if you look at the, you know, the chain of usurpations, the facts listed to justify the Declaration of Independence... Um, it is all mostly procedural things, which is really interesting because people focus on the preamble, and I think rightly so, about the, the laws of nature and nature's God. Um, but that is, all, that is all kind of a foundation for why these things merit uh, a declaration of independence. And uh, the first three or four are all about this king will not assent to laws or allow us to legislate. He, he's, he's standing in the way of normal democratic legislation um, and, you know, that is enough, right? 
Um, and I, I think that's really interesting to, to even read the Constitution in light of that, that it is in many ways a solution to all of these grievances, or at least meant to be. Um, this, is, this is a way that's going to assure that the executive doesn't just appoint whatever justices, you know, that are loyal to, to him um, and then get rid of them when they're not, um, that the laws uh, are king, right, rather than a man, um, that everyone is subject to them, that they are formed by the consent of the governed. Um, that taxes, uh, that trade as well uh, is free, um, all these sorts of things, um, you know, more or less we still do, although I think the extent to which our legislatures are good at legislating is something that might come up uh, as we get to oh, some indeed, other Oh, indeed it will. <laughs> yes. <laughs> indeed it will. Yeah, I, I think, too, this is a perfect opportunity to point out how what we focus on in terms of the founding can and has changed over time. I, I was joking with Dylan before we started the program today that one of my favorite things about Independence Day uh, as somebody who spends too much time online, of course, is the memes. Um, and one of my favorites is you know just the picture of Thomas Jefferson with the caption, oh, is, uh, it says July 3rd, 1776. Oh, is that due tomorrow? Um, which in a way, you know, is unfair, but also it is it is Jefferson writing on a deadline. And what we now regard as just such an incredibly important part of the Declaration was some form of throat clearing in the beginning, the preamble to it. Um, the important part in 1776 is the end is independence. And who do we have to thank for recasting the beginning of the Declaration of Independence as the Im really important part, at least once we've gotten well beyond the Revolutionary War and the founding of the country and the Constitution? It's Abraham Lincoln who looks at the beginning of that and uh, points to it as – this incredibly important part of American history and recasts it in a refounding as the central organizing principle uh, of American life. It reminds me of, I think it's an incredibly underrated speech from Abraham Lincoln, which is something that you could probably say about most speeches of his that aren't the Gettysburg Address, uh, it, because he was an incredible, incredible orator. But I encourage people to go back and read a speech from July 10th, 1858, which is called the Electric Cord Speech. And the passage I'll give you from that is one that I, I like to think about every Independence Day, uh, where he's talking about the population of the country at the time. We have besides these men, descended by blood from our ancestors, among us perhaps half our people who are not descendants at all of these men. They are men who have come from Europe, German, Irish, French, and Scandinavian. Men that have come from Europe themselves or whose ancestors have come hither and settled here, finding themselves our equals in all things. If they look back through this history to trace their connection with those days by blood, they find they have none. They cannot carry themselves back to that glorious epoch and make themselves feel that they are part of us. But when they look through that old Declaration of Independence, they find that these old men say that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. And then they feel that that moral sentiment taught in that day evidences their relation to those men, that it is the father of all moral principle in them, and that they have the, a right to claim it as though they were blood of the blood and flesh of the flesh of the men who wrote that declaration. And so they are. That is the electric cord in that declaration that links the hearts of patriotic and liberty-loving men together, that will link those patriotic hearts as long as the love of freedom exists in the minds of men throughout the world. One, how amazing would it be to have somebody who could talk like that again as a politician? <laughs> uh, but that's a bit beside the point. But again, we have these times when it is necessary, the refocusing on – it's still the same founding, but we have chose to focus on different parts of it that are more relevant to the problems we have currently. Lincoln certainly did that in the 1850s and the 1860s. Um, and I think that is still largely what, to me, governs the way we think about the founding now. Um, and in that sense, that still strikes me as being very strong. Absolutely. Um, you look at um, throughout – any sort of momentous historical event, you are going to get sort of minority and majority reports of various times. And 
anyone looking at a momentous event like the American Revolution is going to be able to pull on different strands at different times to suit different crises and different opportunities for the nation. And that I think is, is the, is the, the long lasting legacy of a truly great transformative historical event is that you're able to keep returning to it as a place of renewal and not having to sort of repudiate it wholesale. Um, that you can bring out new threads to attention, you can accentuate the positive in different ways, figure out ways to incorporate more of the American people into the American legacy. And I think people have an appetite for that. And I don't think people are afraid of those thorny historical questions. When I mentioned those sort of book stop biographies, Alan Gelzo's, you know, book about Lee, new biography about Lee, people are not coming to that book hoping to find either, you know, a picture of Lee as this heroic figure or a picture of Lee as this monster. They are looking, they are coming to that book looking for greater understanding of Lee himself, the Civil War in American life, and its legacy. And they're willing to wade through a giant doorstop of a book in order to do that for themselves. Um, And there's really an appetite for this sort of historical inquiry and resourcement about American history in general, in particularly about the founding generation that you just don't see in, let's say, other areas that, you know, like many of us at at Acton find interesting of like the 16th century, early modern Europe. We would love, I would love if these doorstop biographies were bestsellers of, you know, of Bacchanis, of, (laughs) you know, DeSoto, of, uh, Juan de Mariana. That interest is not there. We hope to cultivate that. There's value in that as well. But it's very much alive for the American founders in particular in American history in general. And I think that's very encouraging. I, I'd like to add uh, just one point in favor of some of the naysayers, uh, maybe more so from the left than the right. Um, the right tends to repudiate ideas or try to. Uh, whereas the left is more going after, I mean, somewhat ideas, but more figures, um, historical facts. Uh, those are in dispute. I think the best defenses against a lot of their claims are that they have the facts wrong. Um, but the idea that, um, you know, we should just give people a pass because of their time, uh, which I don't think is exactly what you were saying. Um, but that is a common idea that, oh, well, you know, he was a man of his time, so on and so forth. I mean, look at Jefferson, his draft of the Declaration uh, before, you know, he, before he had to submit it and it got edited by Franklin and, and whatnot. Um, it included the slave trade as one of the usurpations, uh, as the, one of the grievances to submit to the world. Um, and that you know, very uh, conspicuously got got removed. Um, but Lord Acton had a theory of history, uh, and that was that uh, historical judgment has to make up for the lack of contemporary judgment, and especially in the cases where human life, uh, innocent human life, has been taken. Uh, historians need to be as harsh as possible. Um, that is not a popular view among historians since his time, but I do think it is a challenge worth contemplating. Um, and maybe more to, to your point, um, that it, on the one hand, we should not assume any of these people are perfect. I believe one of them talked about uh, us being governed by men and not angels. Um, that's uh, fairly well known. Um, and uh, at the same time, we, we shouldn't hold any of these people up, uh, even as saints. And saints are not perfect either. They are, they're supposed to be patterns of repentance um, to imitate. Um, but it's okay if we discover, wow, you know, Abraham Lincoln did a lot of great things uh, for African Americans in this country. Turns out not that great towards Native Americans in this country, right? There's, there's all sorts of things that are very true and it is okay to admit that. It is okay to look them square in the face. In fact, it may even be our duty um, 
from the perspective of responsible history and from the perspective of being responsible Americans. That if we really believe in the ideals of this founding, we should hold no element or person of that founding sacred rather than the ideals themselves. Uh, in, that, in that case, um, I think I you know, weirdly have more sympathies with the, the critics from the left than the right because on the right, they want to throw away the ideals themselves. And those ideals are something uh, that really have changed the world in the last 246 years in a way that is just incomparable to almost anything in human history. Um, and it's something that we should never take for granted. And it is a good thing, um, as bizarre as it is that we celebrate with Chinese explosives, that we celebrate it every year. Um, it, is, it is something worth remembering, not just for the United States, but as uh, said in the, the great movie Independence Day, uh, for all people, right? Um, it, it is something that you know, the idea that all people are created equal and that they have equal rights given to them by God, by the author of nature. Um, these are biblical truths, Christian truths, but they were first implemented, albeit very imperfectly, um, uh, in the modern world anyway, here in the United States and beginning with that Declaration of Independence. Um, so I think I think we can we can be unafraid and we can be courageous even to criticize anybody and anything in history and look at that dark side and admit it and ask ourselves, what can we do better? Uh, because these ideals actually encourage us to do so. You make a really interesting point about <clears throat> that Actonian view on history. Uh, it, I think it also points to something that I was talking about on this program last week, which is the ability to hold ideas in your head that are in tension and be okay with that. Um, so I think you can you can look at the example that you gave of striking the slave trade as one of the usurpations from the Declaration of Independence. Another clear example of that, which is one of those that that drives me batty, because people. People misunderstand it and I think a lot of people misunderstand it unintentionally and I think there are some people who willfully misrepresent it to get people to misunderstand it. And that is the um, three-fifths clause in the Constitution. So I think that there is an incredibly appropriate, uh, as you laid out, Actonian way of looking at something like that, looking at the striking of the slave trade from the Declaration of Independence and saying that that is a moral wrong, right? Because it was – uh, it failed to properly address the moral atrocity that was slavery. But that also needs to be weighed against the reality that uh, do we have a country? Do you get enough people to sign on to the Declaration of Independence in order to declare independence from Britain? Uh, do you – you know, again, the point, of course, on the three-fifths clause is that the people who wanted slaves in the South to be counted as full people uh, were the representatives from the South. It would have increased their population. It would have given them a larger share of representation in Congress. And the three-fifths clause in counting them as less than a person, which is the argument that you get, is like, oh, they thought the slaves were less than a person. Uh, for essentially census purposes, yes, and that was a good thing for the abolitionist movement because it equalized the power in Congress by not counting them as citizens down there where they clearly were not citizens in the South. Uh, it is okay, again, to, on one hand, view anything that continued the legacy of slavery in this country as a great moral wrong and also being able to understand why the compromises were made at the time. Um, those are hard judgments to make. They, they are not given to simple black and white analysis. Which is why I'll agree with Dan that it's encouraging that you get these lengthy biographies of some of the people that are involved and opportunities for the exploration of the reasons why these things came to exist and existed at the time. Um, you know, the, as, as I've often heard pointed out, the thing that, you know, we, we should certainly regard slavery as a great moral blight on the founding of this country. We also fought a war to get rid of it. Um, and we should recognize those two things as standing simultaneously. Uh, and we, again, seem to – there's a lot of people who want to reduce it down to simple black and white, to simple yes or no. And I think a, a lot of this is just not given to that kind of analysis. Yeah, you've got serious problems with <clears> – <throat> 
the way that we tend to try to want to politicize history. And there's a way to do that that is very destructive and which turns um, the people against the nation itself. Um, but there's an also there's a constructive way to do that as well. And you alluded to this with Abraham Lincoln's approach, going back to the Declaration. There are ways in which the various complications of history and the moral judgments that are necessary in doing any history can be a national project that we all engage in constructively and that can help build a better foundation for our politics in the future, as opposed to sort of weaponizing these, um, you know, real or imagined cruelties in the nation's history as a way to undermine its institutions, the democratic process, the rule of law, and uh, respect for fellow citizens. Let's close the segment with uh, a question that I will pose to each of you and answer myself. Uh, what is, if you have one, your favorite Independence Day tradition? It can be a personal one. It can be a family one. It can be a local community one. It can be a national one. It can be really anything that you want it to be. Read into the question whatever you want. Uh, Dylan. Oh, man. Um, I mean, I think it's it's just like cookouts, grilling, food, that kind of thing. Um, my kids are pretty little, um, so I always did the fireworks growing up, um, but the it's – it's too much for the the little ones. So, you know, once they're a little bit older, the oldest, uh, we were going to take him, but then it was kind of rainy, and so we didn't know if they were going to do it. Um, so that's that's something I always remember. But um, but we did, my, my brother came over, and we lit off a bunch of, you know, firecrackers on the sidewalk and that kind of thing. And um, I don't know, just I guess the simplicity of um, an, hopefully an easy day <laughs> to plan around your whole family day off of work but there's parades and there's cookouts and there's a, a, something at night and it's just um there's a lot of times you have a day off with your family like oh boy now what are we gonna do yeah <laughs> right uh, this is not one of those days this is a day where there's there's more than you could possibly choose uh to do um and that actually it's very successful i think in that sense of getting people to reflect upon really the blessing to live in a country where where we have these freedoms and rights. My kids are 11 and 9, and, and last night was the first time that we had them stay up for the fireworks display that started at 10 p.m. Uh, it was Thankfully, we only had to go right out our back door in order to sit in the big field and watch them in East Grand Rapids. So it was, it was very nice, very lovely, but yeah, first time given the age that that was plausible. Dan? Fireworks each and every year. There are a lot of people that are down on fireworks this day, these days because they have kids and pets and they're traumatized. I feel for you. I appreciate that concern. And for the day itself, this is the fireworks day. Um, you know, try to keep it limited, try to keep it respectful, but I will, I will not abide a firework less 4th of July the other thing that I always try to do is some very self-consciously American things. Read some Longfellow. Take some time to put on the jazz record. Watch some baseball. Throw the ball around. These are things that I always do, not each and every year, but every year I try to take something distinctly American that I love and make myself more conscious of the fact that this is a part of me and this is part of my nation and uh, try to celebrate those little things, um, hot dogs and hamburgers on the grill, all of that. And of course, you know, the sort of civic participation, which, you know, it's going to be very sad when we get into this later. Um, but Fourth of July parades have also always been a fixture for myself and my family since I was a little boy um, growing up. Um, rode on a fire truck once. Uh, my <clears throat> uh, grandfather was a public safety officer. There was a, you know, one of my favorite Fourth of July memories is riding in that fire truck with him during the Fourth of July parade. So mine, uh, being somebody who listeners to this podcast probably know watches too much television is a somewhat television related tradition. It's one that I am not 
quite able to share with my kids yet. Again, I said they were 11 and 9, but they're, they're getting there. Um, and this usually ends up being about a two-day undertaking to do this. But, of course, so much of the focus on Independence Day is on uh, de- the Declaration of Independence and the Revolutionary War. The Battle of Gettysburg was fought July 1st through 3rd. In 1863, and this, of course, is the turning point in the Civil War. Uh, There is a four and a half hour long epic, Gettysburg, uh, that was made in 1993. It is the only movie I have ever seen in a theater that had an intermission. Uh, which I thought was incredibly cool at the time. I'm not quite sure why, but the idea that there was an intermission in a movie just seemed to be incredibly cool. Um, But the the cast of the movie is incredible. Martin Sheen, Tom Berenger, Sam Elliott, Jeff Daniels. One of the reasons that I love it is um, it is, of course, an incredibly important point in the Civil War. It is the turning point in the Civil War and whether or not we are going to continue to have uh, a single nation. But it also very effectively tells what I think is one of the most underappreciated stories and one of about one of the most underappreciated figures in American history. And that is the character that Jeff Daniels plays, Colonel uh, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, who led the 20th Maine Volunteer Regiment. They were the regiment that was stationed at Little Round Top on the far end of the Union Army flank. And... It is also a great example of what the military calls mission command, which is you are given mission objectives and you may be given a desired way to achieve that objective, but you are also given the chaos that comes in conflict, the ability to improvise. And that is what Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain did, which after six charges from the Confederate army up that hill, they find themselves largely without ammunition and they're charging up again. So he orders them to fix bayonets and they charge down the hill at the Confederate Army. That was not what he was instructed to do. But him making that decision in that moment in time and having his unit charge down the hill at the Confederate Army perhaps saves the victory for the Union Army in the Battle of Gettysburg in the next day. Uh, because it doesn't allow the Confederate Army to go over the hill and get behind the Union Army and be able to attack them from behind. It guaranteed them a better position. And it is a, like I said, it's a long movie. It is an epic, but it is um, it is a good movie, and I highly recommend it to people if they haven't seen it. But again, you may need two days to watch it because four and a half hours is a lot. Sadly now, as both Dylan and Dan have alluded to, let's move on to our second topic, which is an awful one. There was a shooting at an Independence Day parade in Highland Park, Illinois, yesterday. Uh, The details of it that we have, that we know at this point, uh, is that there were six people killed, seriously injuring 31 people. Uh, Someone shot a rifle from a rooftop into the parade, uh, probably just made all the more. And again, we live in this age now where video circulates almost immediately, and the video... The chaos of it is made even more tragic by the marching band going by and you hear the snare drums and it almost becomes impossible to distinguish between the gunshots and the snare drums until you realize that people are running. Um, Just absolutely horrifying uh, that something like this again happens and that happens at such a, as, as both you, Dylan, and you, Dan, alluded to, like one of the great family togetherness days and going to parades and and doing all of that. Um, So again, we find ourselves having a conversation about mass shooting incidents like this and what can possibly be done about it. Dylan, I'll start with you. What, if anything, can be done about these? Yeah, so I I went to a parade yesterday with my kids. Um, So it's, you know, that definitely hit really hard to see the news yesterday that something that was so innocent, um, you know, as Dan so well described from his own memories, um, was the opposite um, for some people today or yesterday. Um, I I am not, I, I certainly, you know, we, we have a Second Amendment. Um, it is important. It is something that needs to be upheld. But I am not an absolutist, uh, as some people in the conservative movement. I'm okay 
uh, with the with certain proposals for restrictions. I am, however, very skeptical about a lot of the practicality. Um, there are just so many guns in the United States that you could restrict the sales today of all guns. You know, you couldn't constitutionally, but theoretically you could. And there'd still be at least one gun per person, if not more than that in the United States. So it doesn't really get at the problem of gun access. And I don't really know that there's a policy solution to that um, other than uh, one that is also impractical, and that is uh, a buyback program like they did in Australia in the 90s, for example. Uh, but our government would actually have to have money uh, to, to buy back uh, guns from people, and they'd have to be able to set that price high enough that even uh, some holdouts would, would be willing to consider it. Um, and we are looking at 8% inflation right now. Um, I, we don't have any funds for this sort of thing, so it would just be done with borrowed money again if we did it. Um, and it could you know, be a tipping point, unfortunately, for some of our economic woes. Um, so it's just not something that I see at all very plausible, at least on a national level. Um, I do think, though, that doesn't mean nothing can be done. And what needs to be looked at is the other side of things, um, which I don't know that there's necessarily a policy solution to, um, but it's it's at least where I think the conversation ought to be. And that is that um, in basically all of these cases, the shooters fit a similar MO. They are young men, usually in their teens, or early 20s, um, not necessarily with any kind of mental illness, as I try to mention every time uh, this sort of thing comes up. Um, it does not correlate with violence. In fact, it correlates with being a victim of violence. Um, but uh, young men who, for whatever reason, are at a point of despair in their lives, and not simply despair, um, but a genuine hatred um, and animosity towards others, that they go out and they do something uh, so terrible as this. Um, and that is something that we need to ask ourselves. You know, I don't think everything can be broken down to structural causes. Um, on the other hand, though, there is a very clear pattern here. And we might want to ask ourselves why in the last 30 years or so uh, has this continually been the case? Um, and I think that is going to be our best hope uh, for reducing uh, these sorts of occurrences. We have to find a way to reach these young men uh, with real tangible hope, um, with genuine love. I don't think governments can do that very well, but again, we probably could look at some of the, the structures of our nation, whether culturally or uh, perhaps institutionally, and ask ourselves, well, what are... What are you know, not not to in any way absolve responsibility, but what is what is pushing people in this direction? I'm going to repeat the same incredibly unsatisfying thing that I said the last time we discussed one of these incidents in the Uvalde shooting. Public policy cannot fix people's souls. It cannot mend broken souls. And there is an instantaneous reaction as to suggest that making certain public policy choices differently or even as kind of Dylan alluded to, the problem is going back and invalidating a part of the Constitution, removing a part of the Constitution that has been there since the enactment of the Bill of Rights. Uh, one has the problem of it's not going to happen. Um, but even if it did, it doesn't make this clearly troubled person whole again. And I know that that is a dissatisfying thing to hear because it would be great if we had very easy solutions to these problems. And that's one of the things that I find incredibly frustrating about the conversation that comes after these incidents. And I think we should begin also by acknowledging there are too many of them. Um, we, we should also be serious about it that you know there's a lot of this um, – frankly, just wrong information that uh, cause someone had pointed out that there was just a mass shooting in Copenhagen, Denmark. And, you know, it's like it's one of like two that has happened in a year uh, in Denmark. And, uh, you know, like there's been 68 in the last month. There have not been 68 in the last month. This is also one of the things that was frustrating for me as somebody who lived for about 15 years in Chicago, that immediately you got a lot of very dumb online reactions that are like, you know, oh, just typical Chicago. It is not. That is not Highland Park. This is the North Shore of Chicago. This is a very wealthy, well-off, quiet community. It is not like we are talking about the gang violence. 
that happens in the city of Chicago that is often lumped in to these conversations about these kinds of incidents. And I think, well, one should be morally abhorred by what happens in the inner city in Chicago. We should separate it out as a different conversation than what we're talking about here. But very quickly, I want to give you the subheads in this CNN piece about what we know about the shooter. We will continue the tradition. I think more media should do. We will not say this person's name, but we will talk in general about them. He legally obtained the weapon used, Mayor tells CNN. He posted violent imagery online. His uncle saw no warning signs. Again, we're talking about patterns, right? Where 18 to 22 year, years old was the profile of the suspect that was given. I believe he's 22 years old. Uh, and you get this, you know, it is frustrating and I understand and I can put my, try to put myself in the position of family members of this individual where you think no matter how many red flags may be presented that you can help them. You know them best. You don't want to turn them over to the authorities. You don't want to put them in a mental institution. We can help them. And so often it seems to be the case that that is not true, that they are wrong about that. Again, this pattern that we see, he legally obtained the weapon. He had a history of posting violent imagery online he seemed to be some kind of a SoundCloud rapper that if you watched, you know, it was the people found videos that he had posted almost instantly. And they are, you know, in retrospect, you could see it telegraphed what he was going to do. And in minimum at the time, you would say that's worrisome and somebody should have said something or th- tried to alert somebody to that. At minimum, the family that is closest to this person to understand that something is not right here. But again, this pattern repeats. And while I don't think that means that we should uh, completely ignore the public policy conversation, we should not. A lot of the stuff that Dylan, you raised is they are solutions that a lot of people throw out there. Um, And perhaps some of them, if enacted, would help on the margins. But again, I I just end up thinking (laughs) it doesn't fix people's broken souls. And there are only, you know, the only true love and caring for somebody as a human being can have the potential of doing that. And there are cultural phenomenons in our country that sadly persist that are much harder to deal with. They don't lend themselves to soundbite solutions, but are the only way that we are going to begin to start preventing things like this from happening in the future. This does seem to be a sort of cultural wide sort of um, mind virus, for lack of a better term. This seems to be a way that particular persons, and we've talked about the demographics of particularly young men, this seems to be the form that many have sort of latched onto as a way of lashing out. And I don't know if that is partially because of media coverage. There's a desire for fame or infamy even, um, not caring about the difference. Um, this is also something that's sadly... Um, you know, it's it's more common in the United States, but it's becoming more common in other places. And Copenhagen this weekend is an example of that. But that's that's not alone. Um, this is a very very challenging. If if I'm if I'm right, if this is if this is um, sort of a a mode of deviant behavior, a mode of expressing this deviant behavior that is increasingly spreading around the world, um, that's that's something more akin to something like terrorism, which is a mode of political expression. This is not – These are usually not overtly political acts, but they're definitely a way of enacting a sort of hostility, externalizing a sort of hostility and loathing to the world that is becoming a sort of language of its own and that is reproducing itself in a very troubling way. And I think um, one of the ways 
to combat this is one of the things that we're doing on this podcast, which is which is not to name, um, and which is something that I'm I'm glad to see many more media outlets doing. And I think that this is a phenomenon that we do not understand well enough, and both the left and the right tend to conflate this with other issues that can affect public safety in certain contexts such as the prevalence of firearms, absolutely, and such as, as many on the right, uh, unfortunately, will demonize people with mental health issues and link them as the cause to this. And Dylan rightly points out that um, most people struggling with issues of mental health are completely nonviolent. Um, the sort of stigmatization that happens um, some of these folks, and again, this category of mental health is a very sort of loosey-goosey category. Like if you have an interaction with a psychologist, does that mean that you have a mental health problem? If you receive a diagnosis at some point, as opposed to not receiving a diagnosis. Some of these um, people in these shootings have had those sorts of interactions. Many have not. Um, and I think it's important that to realize also that you can be a malevolent antisocial person without being having a diagnosed mental illness. And that there is a very strong impulse among many people because these things are incredibly awful and incomprehensible to say, oh, well, it's because the person was crazy. And because of the, the terrifying possibility that these that these are morally calculated actions and these are malevolent people who wish to inflict pain on those around them is just too horrible for us to bear. But I think that's something we have to keep in mind when discussing these issues is that is that evil is is a real thing in the world. There may be public policy ways to address that, um, again, on the margin to make, uh, you know, to make the public safer. But I think we, we run the risk if, if we try to reduce this simply to a question of the availability of firearms or simply to questions of mental health, which are so often the caricatures on both the left and the right that emerge after these tragic events. So I think just to piggyback on what you were saying, Dan, uh, the comparison or the reference to terrorism, I think, is actually the right way to think about this. Not in the sense of the political motivations for terrorism, but in the sense of the spiritual motivations. And the reason why a lot of counterterrorism doesn't work or is so counterproductive or just seems, you know, frustratingly um, uh, impotent uh, it's because people have these larger reasons for doing them. Unfortunately, in this case, I think it's very often an absence of larger meaning in their life. Um, but that, to me, uh, that that's going to have psychological effects on a person. They may be depressed. They may be anxious. Um, but that is a crisis of meaning is ultimately a spiritual problem. You know, as you mentioned, Eric, these are people with broken souls. Um, and at least as a Christian, I believe I know the solution to that problem. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it is the church that he founded. Um, so I think, uh, I, I remember uh, several years ago, uh, there was someone in town um, who uh, went, he, it wasn't like a school or whatever, but he he shot some people in a public place and then shot himself. Um, and my priest, who was very old at the time, and even, you know, probably already having some symptoms of dementia. He's, he's since passed away, but uh, he was my first priest, and I remember him very fondly. And I remember this sermon, this homily very fondly, um, because I can't imagine what, what would I say in that position. Um, but he said, you know, what can we do better? That was his message. How, how did this person who lives in our community slip by us? How, did, how was he untouched by our love? Right. That that's the question we need to start asking. And it's a question that I think especially churches need to be asking themselves. Um, there is something that can be done. I'm not saying that therefore religion is just a, a magic, you know, cure uh, or anything like that. I'm saying that the real embrace of a community. 
um, of genuine love, of demonstrating, uh, you know, the the message of the gospel, getting people help if they need it, um, if they do need, you know, psychological help, if they do need uh, other things. A lot of people uh, don't have meaning in life because they don't have a job, so maybe they didn't need somebody to help them find a job. You know, there's, there's all sorts of things, relationships, mentors, uh, from which we find meaning um, that people need, and if they are just disconnected from all of that, um, in any real way, um, they're going to find themselves, uh, you know, spiraling into despair. Um, they'll find themselves in some of the darker corners of the internet, uh, searching for community among similar people, uh, who don't have very constructive, uh, suggestions. Um, and I think we'll keep seeing this again and again. Um, doesn't mean that we can, again, magically prevent it, but I, I think that, uh, Christians especially, not, you know, certainly perhaps other people of other religions as well, but Christians especially should be asking themselves, what can we do better in our churches and in our communities uh, to find these people and uh, to love them in a way uh, that brings them out of this place of darkness? I want to touch on a couple of things that both of you have pointed to. The the point that you just made, Dylan, about finding you know, corners of the internet, I mean, this is... This is one of the things I think we should spend more time thinking about is how do we reach people? Um, and, and I think that what you said there is, I think, absolutely spot on uh, where we should think about, you know, how was this person? How was a person who did something like this untouched by the love of the community around them? Um, it, it becomes all that more paramount at a time where whatever deviant belief that you have you can go and you can find people who will reinforce it. And talking about some of the other public problems that we have in this country, I've often made the point that I have to credit my friend Joe Tabor for coming up with the other half of, um, where, you know, whether you want to call it cancel culture or wokeness or all these other terms that I don't really care for using because they don't, they, they gesture at phenomenon while also at the same time being insufficient to actually describe them. Um, I think there is some kind of a functioning civic religion in this country that is without forgiveness but with perpetual atonement. And the problem is that if you have a any kind of terrible beliefs, instead of – imagine yourself in the circumstance. You know, if you're around somebody who says something that is racially off color and they are, you know, either a member of your family, a member of your, you know, uh, church group, a member of your bowling league, you know that person on a personal level. You can take them aside and say, hey, that really isn't cool. And you can reach them in a way that if you don't know that person on that personal level, it's just never going to land. The problem that exists now with the internet is they will find essentially – two groups of people coming at them. One of them that wants to excommunicate them from polite society forever for whatever the milkshake ducking thing is that they said. And another group of people that says, no, you're right. You're absolutely correct about that. And the only way you're going to reach those people is outside of cyberspace, is to reach them on a personal and a human level. I think that's incredibly important. Um, Another point that Bear's just mentioning is the – since we brought up Copenhagen and there, you know, there, there, is, there are points to be made about all of that. We should also recognize the point where those things just terminate though, where comparing the United States to other countries um, is good on, only insofar as it goes. We're not like Denmark. It is just the point that is misunderstood about American exceptionalism that I've made dozens of times on this program um, is that it doesn't mean we're exceptional in the way your sixth grade teacher would say that you're exceptional. It means Americans are different. It means it in great ways. It means it in awful ways. Being more violent is one of those awful ways. I think we should at least be cognizant of that fact. I want to make a note on all as well the fact that Stan pointed out more media, you're right, are not saying the names of the people who perpetrate these acts. This one was a little different because there was an active manhunt going on yesterday and the need to circulate the name and the identity of the person so that they could be tracked down um, is important. But I think uh, media, uh, we play our own small role in that here. Uh, but more should be cognizant of the fact that we should not give these people what they're seeking, which is fame, especially because we see this phenomenon of when one of these incidents happens, another happens shortly after it. And it is because of this um, infusing it with a 
kind of a sense of glory, if you're looking at it from that perspective, is, is deeply problematic. One final thing. Dan pointed to this, and I think it's, a, it's something that deserves mentioning. When we're looking for balance in things, you know, we talked earlier about holding different ideas that are in tension in your mind. We had um, a regime surrounding questions of mental health in this country that for a long time made it very easy to involuntarily commit someone, to put them in a facility against their will. The upside of that would be that more people who probably should be getting that kind of attention, who probably should be removed from society if only for a short period of time, perhaps longer, probably got it. The downside of being able – of it being much easier to involuntarily commit someone is people who didn't deserve that, who were put in those places for other reasons other than their actual mental health. It was easy to do that. We had a change in this country that made it much harder to involuntarily commit people. You can understand the arguments for that. But there is – as there is the upside to that latter group that I just mentioned of people who didn't deserve to be involuntarily committed who were, that fell – but we also see the fall in the number of people who do need help, who may have to be, um, who may have to be treated against their desires to be treated. That also falls. So I think I think that's very true. Um, again, I would I would harp on the issue though that this is not clearly, at least, necessarily reducible to me- mental health issues. Um, and but I think it's. I, I agree, though, that there there was kind of a, a baby going out with the bathwater issue with not so much the getting rid of um, involuntary uh, institutionalization, but just institutions in general. The idea that there are places people can go, um, there are fewer of those. Uh, many of them were shut down for good reasons. There, there were some very terrible practices and abuses. However, I think uh, along the same logic. Again, you know, getting back to my point. Um, Younger generations, now I, I will be the first to tell you to take everything with a grain of salt in terms of generational co- comparison, that sort of thing, but certainly younger people are going to church less. They are part of church communities less. I do not blame them for that. I think more likely people need to look at their families and their churches and ask, what happened? Um you know, I, I grew up in the 90s when churches were all going in the directions of we got to have a rock band youth group, you know, sort of thing. Um, and that that got me to stop going to church. <laughs> um, I came back, thank God. Um, but there is a lot of very well intended uh, approaches uh, to young people that have failed, just demonstrably failed. Um, and people need to think very soberly about these sorts of things and ask themselves, are the young people in our communities really getting uh, the the spiritual nourishment, counseling, mentorship that they need. I think, unfortunately, you know, tragic events like what happened yesterday uh, at least tell us that we could be doing better. So there's a terrifying thought <clears throat> that I return to periodically that finds its origins in Sigmund Freud, and that is that civilization somehow breeds its own discontents, that part of the consequences of having a society and culture is that you create people that cannot fit into it. Um, I think that's wrong. I think that what Dylan is talking about in building a more inclusive society is something that we're all called to do. That being said, there is a role, and I think Eric is, is, is right in this, is we have, to, we have to balance this with the protection of society as a whole. And what happened when we deinstitutionalized in one sense, it wasn't merely that the mental institutions were emptied of these people. What happened was many of these people went into prison because they were not able to function socially. They got in trouble with the law and they're incarcerated. And I think when many Americans rightfully look and are very concerned with Americans' incarceration rate, I think they don't factor that in as part of it. As part of, um, you can never completely deinstitutionalize. You're just transferring between one and the other. And I think we did go far in that, too far in that direction.
direction is that there are a certain amount of people that are going to struggle so terribly with integrating into normal social life that if you do not give them the structure of an institution, they might become a danger to themselves, to others, disruptive to the community, in which a case then, then the situation is, is to incarcerate them in a prison. Um, and I don't think that that is the solution. That's not the effect that people were hoping for. People were hoping we had developed new sort of chemical treatments for chemical imbalances and that, oh, we could just give these people medication now and they'll be fine. And it wound up not being that simple. And unfortunately, we we dismantled the institutions before we acknowledged the difficulty um, of just how profoundly difficult it is to integrate these folks into society and bring them, you know, and to surround them with the love and the support they need. Sometimes that requires an institutional context. Sometimes that institutional context is family, community. Sometimes it's a mental hospital. If somebody is having a particular difficult time, sometimes it is prison. If you demonstrate a sort of violent uh, disregard for the safety of your community. Um, And all of those have to be sort of on the table as solutions. Um, And when we tend to reduce it all down to one, I think that's when you get these sort of like pathological responses that don't think through the various consequences of, of what that would look like. Dan makes a great point that as, as we deinstitutionalize people from mental health facilities, they more of them end up in prison. And what have we been having a conversation uh, regularly about in this country over the last 10 years or so over incarceration problems? You add that to the, the other element to that as well is that you can find examples of this in the literature of people who went into prison who – came out more likely to be a lifelong criminal because of the nature of the institution that they were put into, which is, again, just to bring us back to the point that like these things are not easy to solve. These are huge societal questions that there are not simple answers for. And I think we it, it is okay to begin these conversations by admitting that there are not easy answers. And, well, I'll say it. Ignoring the people who are trying to say that there are easy answers to all of this. There are difficult things to grapple with and we should try to do that rather than looking for these uh, magic solutions. They're going to fix all of our problems for us because they just don't exist out there. We've gone very long today on our first two topics, so I think we will punt our final topic on the Supreme Court's uh, decision in West Virginia, the EPA, to next week's program. So we will call it a wrap there. Thank you for listening to Act and Unwind. If you're listening to this podcast on our website, please look in the show notes for a link where you can subscribe directly to Act and Unwind or just search Act and Unwind on your favorite podcast app. Also, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, five-star reviews only, so that more people will find this show. Thanks to Dan. Thanks to Dylan for the Acton Institute. This is Eric Cohn. We'll see you next week. Thank you for listening, and I want to ask that if you're listening to us on